Hey, good morning, you guys. My name is Patrick. I'm one of the volunteers here at uh, Venture Church. Every once in a while, I get a chance to, to speak, to bring you the message. Um, we're doing this series, Welcome to Your Neighborhood, or Won't You Be My Neighbor, whatever it is. Uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor. I can't actually see the screen, so I have no idea what it says. Um, and everybody yesterday, when they found out I was preaching, were like, you're going to wear a cardigan, right? You're going to wear a cardigan. Well, I don't own any cardigans, so I put on my hoodie so that we would have kind of the same vibe going, right? It, it's the same thing, a hoodie and a cardigan. One is just cooler than the other one, and I'll let you decide which is which for you. No judgment, no judgment. But uh, Chris and his family are off uh, spending some time with their family right now. Their, uh, Chris's grandmother, his, his dad's mom, is, uh, had a, a stroke and a brain aneurysm, and they're there with them and seeing what can be done. So keep Chris uh, and his family in your prayers. But I'm excited that I get to share with you because it's always a good time to do that. Uh, you know, when I think about neighbors, I think about the fact that I've had a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different neighbors in my life. You see, when I was a kid, my mom and dad split up, and so I had a single mom with four kids that would go wherever the cheapest rent was or wherever the job was, and so we moved a lot. Uh, let me put it this way to you. When I started school in kindergarten, I was in one school. By the time I graduated high school, I had been to 13 different schools. And a lot of the times that we moved, we were still in the same school district. It was a lot. We moved around a lot. But there were some neighbors that really stuck in my brain that as I was thinking about it, I was like, man, I remember that guy. You know, that's cool. There was one when I was in middle school, we would get off the bus every day. And every day, the same old guy would be sitting across the street. I can't remember his name because I wasn't that good of a neighbor because I was 12. Um, but he'd be sitting in the driveway in a kitchen chair, smoking a cigar every day when we got off the bus. And we'd wave at him, you know, what's going on? I think his name was Henry or Harvey or something like that. But we'd be like, hey, what's going on? And then we'd go inside. That was a long story. But I remember that guy because it was every day. If it was raining, he sat out there with an umbrella. It was all, all the time, every day. It didn't matter, hot or cold, rain or shine. He was sitting in his like dining room chair in the driveway. And I always thought that was the craziest thing. Uh, another neighbor that I really remember were the Stallings. They actually lived one house over from us, but they had kids that were mine and my sister's age at the time. I guess they still are our ages, but we would hang out with them a lot. Like that was just our thing. We'd get all, we rode the bus together. We went to school together. We got home, we hung out, we did things. It was great. And uh, like I would do crazy stuff like play football with them. And uh, if you know me, you know that's weird, but it's okay because we would also go bike riding. And Brad, the, the brother, had the coolest bike. It was a mongoose. I don't know if you're from my time frame, but mongoose used to be like the bike to have. It had the pegs on it on both sides and like the handlebar would spin all the way around like it didn't get stuck on it. Man, I wanted a mongoose. I never had one. Now you can go buy a mongoose for like 20 bucks at Walmart and it's not cool anymore. It happened to lots of things that were cool when I was a kid. They got bought out by Walmart and Target and now they're not. But that's what I remember about those neighbors. Uh, those were neighbors that I interacted with all the time. Like every day I would talk to them or, or at least wave at them. I had other neighbors that I really remember that I think I knew better, but I didn't interact with as often. Uh, one that comes to mind are some neighbors I had when I lived in the middle of nowhere. Um, they lived uh, about 200 yards across the field from us. Um, William and Beth are their names. And William and Beth were awesome. They were great people. They were exciting to be around. They uh, had cool toys like boats and four-wheelers and uh, a gator, which is a, like a six-wheeled drive-around car thing. I don't even know, but it was awesome. And hanging out with them was super cool. But not only that, they were really good spiritual mentors for me. They, they had uh, their head on right when it came to God. And we really enjoyed William and Beth. But what the crazy thing was, even though we really liked each other, like these were smart enough people that they thought that my meatloaf was the best meatloaf that had ever been created in the world, which is right. That's the correct thing. Um, even though that was true, it, it was hard to get together. We lived 200 yards apart, and it took a miracle to get our families to do something together. Part of that was because we lived in the middle of nowhere, and it was 45 minutes to get to Walmart, which meant that it was an hour to get to anything else. And so we spent a lot of time in the car and just didn't have the ability to hang out. 
Um, but there's also the fact that William was a successful businessman. He ran a, a multi-million dollar road construction company. Uh, him and his family did that by themselves and uh, it was awesome and he was always busy with that or the fact that he was the pastor of a house church in his house and was always busy doing that. Or maybe it was the fact that he liked going and sitting out in the woods in the cold and shooting defenseless animals so that he could bring them back for me to eat, which was awesome. But when you put all those things together, it made it difficult to have a cookout with the guy that lives across the field. There was another neighbor we had before William and Beth uh, that I think his name was Floyd, but it could have been Lloyd or, or Frank. Uh, I, it was some old redneck name. That's all I can remember. And we're going to call him Floyd today, though. But, but Floyd lived only 20 feet from ours. Like, I, I could throw a ball out of my kitchen window into his kitchen window with very good accuracy, and I'm not a great thrower. It was that close. And between our houses, there was only a three-foot-high chain-link fence. And not the one with, like, the slats in it. Just straight chain link. And so if anything was going on in either of our yards, the other one knew about it completely. Like that was just the way it was and it was cool, it was fine. So I'd see Floyd out there and I, you know, he'd be doing something. I'd walk over to the fence, and, you know, like you do as a good neighbor. You're like, oh yeah, let me walk over there and go, over. hey Floyd, how's it going? He'd walk home, mumble over to me and he'd start saying something. I'd be like, how's it going? What's up? You know, how, blah, blah, blah. And no sooner than I started talking to him, every single time, someone would either pull up in the yard and call him over to, to their car to, to talk about something or do something or work on something, or his wife would stick his head out, her head out the window and yell at him to go to the store or to come inside. And I started getting a mental thing about it. I'm like, does, does she think that I'm a bad influence? Like, does she just not want him to talk to me? Because every time I went and said hey to him, it was, no, hey, uh, Floyd, come here, buddy. I gotta, we gotta do something. But I figured it out. I think he may have been in like uh, witness protection and he was really bad at it. And so they couldn't talk to me because he might blow his cover. Um, You know, conspiracy theories aside, it was probably something more about the fact that he was just always in a hurry. He was just always busy with something to do. You know what? I feel like as I've lived my life, I've learned that That's what we all do, isn't it? We just live life in a hurry. We live life as though we've got to get to the next thing as fast as possible. And if we don't, then something's going to be bad. Because as a culture, we've decided to place value on productivity. We've decided to place value on results. We determine who we are by the things that we do. The activities that we're a part of. And we're always in a hurry. Think about when you see a friend that you've not seen for a while. What's your your go-to response? How you been doing? Oh, man, I've been busy. I've been doing this, and I've been doing this, and I've been doing this, and this has been crazy. And we just list off all the things we're doing so they can go, oh, man, I understand why you haven't talked to me now because you've been busy. It's okay. I've been busy too. I've been doing all these things. And, and that's our response. That's our, our, our way to go. Or maybe, maybe that's not you. Maybe you don't feel busy there, but get on the internet and go to open up something and it doesn't open immediately. Then, then you, you know, you're like, oh man, I am in a hurry. This thing's supposed to already be there. Why is it not already here? I'm gonna run a speed test just to check everything. I'm gonna reboot the router, turn off the computer and turn it back on again. Because it's supposed to be right now. It's supposed to be right here. I'm not supposed to have to wait anymore. Maybe you don't do computers. I can prove with one one word, well, two words, this one concept, that you are always in a hurry. Red light. Have you ever been stopped at a red light? Because one of two things is going to happen at a red light. Either you're going to be so frustrated that you're at the red light that you're like, oh my gosh, just turn green. Come on, come on. Those guys aren't even moving. Just Either you're going to get frustrated, which my wife yells at me about all the time, or as soon as that light turns green, if you're not already halfway through the, the intersection, the people behind you are laying on their horn, say, come on, what are you doing? Let's go. Because we're always in a hurry. We're always in a hurry. 
And we do it without even realizing it. We fill our life with just busyness. With just busyness. We've got to fill it up and make sure that every second is full and packed and good and wonderful and doing something and accomplishing something and producing something and having some results that we can tangibly see and feel and understand. And this busyness affects us. This busyness affects the way that we live our life. It affects the relationships that we have and it affects the way we neighbor. Right now we're in this series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And what I want to specifically look at today is how our busyness, how our hurried lifestyle affects our ability to love neighbors the way that Jesus wants us to. Last week, Chris was here, and he was talking about loving your neighbor, and he's talking about the obedience factor, that, that God wants us to be walking around with their head up, with their eyes up, looking to see where we can be proactive in helping the people around us. And if you didn't get a chance to hear that, it's on the podcast. Check it out. It was, it's a really good message. Um, and maybe you were here, though, and you got convicted by that, and you said, man, I'm going to do it. I'm going to love my neighbors. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to make them cookies, and I'm going to go see them, and I'm going to learn their names, and I'm going to do all this stuff, and it's going to be great. And you had the greatest intentions, and you had the greatest passion, and you were convicted. And a week's gone by, and it still hadn't happened. Because why? Because I just don't have the time because I'm too busy. This week, I want to look at a moment in Jesus's life, a little bitty snippet, a little bitty section in Jesus's life where he actually speaks to this objection of not having enough time. Here at Venture Church, every week, we want to look to the Bible to see the truth of God. And in this, this week, we're going to be in the New Testament book called uh, Luke we're going to see a story of Jesus visiting some of his closest earthly friends. Uh, Luke is one of the four books in the Bible that tell about the life of Jesus and his teachings that that he brought forth. Uh, It's in the first four books of the New Testament, which is in the last third of your Bible. And so if you want to go ahead and turn there, or if you don't have a Bible, there's some over here in the corner that are free for you. We want to make sure you have a good readable copy of that uh, to take home with you. You can have it, you can read it, you can write in it, uh, take notes, it's good stuff. But it'll also be up on the screen. And where we are in, in this is Jesus has been busy, you know, we're actually picking up right after he was telling the story that he did last week about the Good Samaritan, and he's coming into a town called Bethany, which is a suburb of Jerusalem, and Jesus, as always, is traveling with his disciples, traveling with his crew of people that are going to follow him around and, and learn from him, and so they decide they're going to stop and see some friends, and we're going to pick up in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. This is what it says. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So here we have met two people, two two ladies, two sisters, Mary and Martha. And we find out that this is Mary and Martha's house. This is probably really Martha's house. I, I don't know if they lived together or not, but they were both close friends of Jesus. And, and Jesus decided, I'm gonna stop in and stay with you guys for a while. Because that's how it worked in the first century in in Jerusalem or in uh, that area because there weren't any hotels. There weren't any, you know, convention centers and meeting centers. So when you came into a town, you had to either go to the marketplace and make a friend and say, hey, friend, now that we're buddies, I'm going to come stay at your house tonight. Or you go to the friend that you made last time and you stay at their house. You know, you just pop in and just knock on the door and be like, hey, what's up? I'm here. Let's hang out. And they're like, cool. That, that's, that's the whole thing. They're, the hospitality of the people of that time was so giant. And, and you can read a lot about that if you go and study the, the time frame. It was actually that hospitality that had God choose Abraham to be the vessel that he was going to use was because Abraham was just so generous and hospitable. And, and that's really cool to see that 
at this point in time, several hundred years after that, those people are still like that. So Jesus comes in, and we get to see this neat little picture of him living a normal life for a second. Get to see this neat little picture of him just visiting some friends. We don't learn about any great teaching or great powerful message that he's given. Jesus is just hanging out. He's just sitting, talking, relating stories of his life. And we meet these two ladies in this very short story. And Luke draws our attention to the fact that these two ladies have a very different reaction to Jesus being in the house. A very different reaction to the fact that the Lord and Savior God in the flesh is sitting in the building. Let's look and see what those are. In verse 39, we learn about Mary. And it says, she sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, I think that says a lot about who Mary is and about what Mary believes about Jesus You see, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a Jewish teacher. And because he was a Jewish teacher, the way that you would go to him and say, I want to learn from you. I want to be your student. I want to be your disciple. I want to be ready to show you the things. I want you to show me the things that you're going to teach is by going and sitting at his feet. You would go and do that and he would go, oh, you want to be my student. Very cool. I will teach you now. What's very interesting about this, though, is that it was not typically something that in the first century a woman would do. That was a a thing that was reserved for the men. Now, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's how it was. But I think that makes what Jesus says in just a minute even cooler. So that's Mary. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus saying, Lord, teach me. And then you got Martha that we see in verse 40. And it says, Martha was distracted by all the preparations that needed to be made. Was anybody else's house like this growing up? You know, we kept the house decently clean. You know, we, we had our chores. We had our things. We had, we had our, our jobs. You know, we had to pick up our toys. And we had to sweep the floor every day and that kind of stuff. But as soon as you found out that somebody was coming over, mom went crazy you got to clean everything and double clean it and then sweep it and then mop it and then pull out the silver from the china cabinet, polish it all and put it back in. Our china cabinet didn't have windows. It was just wood. You couldn't see it. But she made us clean it and sweep out in the, in the closets. The closet where you throw all your shoes. I had to pull all the shoes out, sweep out of there, and then throw the shoes back in, which just made it need to be swept again. But no, you had to do all of that because somebody was coming over seeing the, your blank expressions. I guess I was the only one that had that. Maybe, that's okay. Maybe that's not you. Maybe though you've been to an event that you've been in charge of. You've been a part of getting set up for. And it's a lot to do in a short amount of time. And so you feel that urgency there. We've got to get everything done, everything done. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but we're actually a mobile church, uh, adventure church. We, we pack everything in a trailer every week. So three hours ago, this room was a completely empty gymnasium. I, I know it's, it's mind-blowing to think about that, but it's true. Three hours ago, there was nothing in this room, and now we got chairs and lights and a stage and a dude on, a, on the stage talking like all of these things happened because somebody showed up and somebody did the preparations. And sometimes we do it really, really well. Sometimes we get done early and everything looks great. Sometimes we are pushing it right to the last second to make sure everything's right and everything's working and everything's good. But we do it because we want to put our best foot forward. We want the environment that you walk into to be an environment that makes you go, oh, okay, this is nice. And that's important. See, I don't think what Mary or what Martha was doing was bad. It's okay to take pride in the work that you're doing. It's okay to want to put your best foot forward, especially when someone special might see what you're going to do. And so Martha was trying to be a good hostess. It was natural. Jesus had come to her house and she said, I got to make sure everything is perfect. I gotta make sure everything is right, that supper is on a table, that beds are ready, that everything is good. 
And I want you to remember this. It told us already that Jesus and his disciples came. So it wasn't like one friend showing up. It was like one friend showing up with at least 12 other dudes, probably more, and saying, hey, we're going to hang out at your house for a little bit. Does that blow any of your minds right now? You know, 30 people showing up at your house unexpected and going, hey, when's supper? And so Martha was trying to get all that ready. She was just trying to be a good hostess. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing at all wrong with what she's doing. It's her house and she wants it to be right. But she gets frustrated because she's over here working her tail off and her sister is just sitting at the feet of Jesus. So she does what any sister is gonna do. She goes to Jesus and she complains. Luke 10, verse 40, the rest of the verse. She came to him and asked him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And I love this. Jesus just looks at her. I feel feel like he just shakes his head. And he just looks at her and he says, Martha, Martha. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. I don't doubt that Jesus was very appreciative of all the work that Martha was doing. I'm sure that he was excited about the meal she prepared. He was excited that he was gonna get to sleep in a real bed for the night. He was excited that the sheets had been changed and that the toys had been picked up and whatever else that, that Martha was doing, you know, sweeping the roof just in case somebody decided to go up there and dig a hole. I, I don't know. But whatever she was doing, he was appreciative of it. He was thankful for it. He didn't say, Martha, what are you thinking? Everything you're doing is wasted. Don't you know I can just turn rocks into bread? Just come sit down. No, he didn't say that. He just said, Mary has chosen what is better. That you're worried and upset about all kinds of things, but only one thing is needed. And this is where our lesson comes in today. Because we as a people are so worried about so many things. Constantly and consistently, we are worried about so many things that it's just craziness and it's something that will absolutely drive us crazy. But the worst part of the whole thing is as we're worried about all this stuff, we often miss those really great opportunities to do great things. The opportunities to love, the opportunities to share, the opportunities to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Because even when it comes to the things of God, it's so easy to rush right past the ones that are most important. And it's not that what we're doing instead is bad, quote unquote. It's just not best. Martha going and cleaning up the house and preparing supper wasn't bad. It was good. It needed to be done. But Mary chose better. There are so many things of God that we miss because we're living our life at warp speed. And one of those things is the opportunity to truly love our neighbors. Last week, Chris pointed out that Jesus said we should love our neighbors and he wasn't talking specifically about those that live on our block or those that live in that uh, pound sign hashtag that around us that anyone could be our neighbor but just because anyone can be your neighbor doesn't make those people that do live adjacent to your house not your neighbor We don't get a pass to ignore them just because they live right next to us. So the challenge of this series, the challenge of of Won't You Be My Neighbor is, is about intentionally shining the light of God into the people on our street, into our apartment buildings, and over our privacy fences. That's what it's about Uh, David Runyon is an an author, and he he co-authored a book called The Art of Neighboring, Building Genuine Relationships with the People Right Outside Your Door. 
And he says in there that the number one obstacle to being a good neighbor is time. The number one thing that stops us from neighboring well is time because we live life at a breakneck speed. We live life with everything has got to go, everything's got to go. And not only that, but we are chronically multitasking and doing so many things at once so that we can feel more productive, so that we can feel more useful. And that is leading to an imbalance in our lives. That is leading to a thing that will not only prevent us from neighboring well, it will prevent us from having a healthy spiritual life in general. Runyon in his book says that there are three lies that we tell ourselves to make it okay that we live our lives in this hurried manner. Three lies that we tell ourselves that allow that imbalance to, to stay out of whack. I wonder if any of these three will hit you today. Lie number one. Things will settle down someday. Yeah, mm, we, we, I, I've been there. I don't, I've never, I don't know if I've ever worded it this way, but I'll say stuff like, man, if we can just get through the next week, everything's gonna be easy peasy from there. If we can just make it to Thursday, then it's gonna be all right. If we can just make it to the next paycheck, if we can just get a little bit better, if we can just get to summer, if we can just do... And I gotta be honest, this is something that we fight at my house all the time. Because here's the truth. Your life is never gonna settle down. It's not gonna settle down one day. This is a flat lie because every time you feel like something is taken away, three more things are added and they're constantly inventing new things and new ideas and new sports and new TV shows and new activities that can fill your life up that you're never gonna have a moment's rest unless you do it on purpose. And so in my family, we try to be intentional about that. We try to schedule some margin in. You know, I, I've got a scheduled date night with each of my children throughout the week. And we try to do that every week. But you know what? As intentional as we are, as, as much as our kids are going to say, hey, dad, it's Tuesday. It's my date night. We got to do this. We still miss it sometimes. Because we get too busy. We get pulled in that current of a busy life and nothing can stop us. Because things are not going to settle down unless you just stop doing everything. So that, that's line number one. See, Martha chose what was good. Mary chose what was better. Line number two, more will be enough. More will be enough. Just a little bit more. If I can just get a little bit more, then I'll have enough. If I can just get a better car, you know, one that works and it's good and it's clean and it's nice, then I'll have enough. If I can just get a little bit bigger house, if I can just have a little bit better storage, if I could just have a little bit more, then that'll be enough. My family watches a lot of cooking competition shows. Uh, I, I, we enjoy them. I, I don't know why we enjoy them so much, but like all the way down to the littlest one, well, Amelia just likes moving things, but to Pippin, we all will sit and watch a cooking competition like it is the greatest thing in the world and it doesn't really matter which one it is. Like we watch all of them. And I've learned something about these cooking competitions. If you want to go on a cooking competition and win, you've got to learn when to say, if I put this one more thing on the plate, it's gonna muddle it and mess it up. If I put one more grain of salt, it's gonna be too salty. If I do one more thing, it's too much. I gotta know when to say enough is enough. If you can do that, you can win a cooking competition because the people that lose are always because they tried to do too much, too fast, and it would fail on them every time. The problem is that most of us are not great chefs like that. Most of us don't know when to say is enough, enough is enough, and not just in cooking, but in life. I, I feel like the unofficial motto of America 2019 is more, 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 because that's what we want. More, better, faster, longer. We want it all right here, right now. And this is how we treat our time. We fill it up to the brim. We make sure that every second is covered because we just want more. But here's the thing, friends. If you get more stuff, 
You know, if I was to somehow get more Lego, you know, just putting that out there, I could always build a bigger barn. I could always build another room. I can move into a bigger house. I can figure that out. I can have more room for Lego, always. My wife's shaking her head. It's true though. We figure it out. You know, if you get an extra car, if you get new things, if you get more TVs, if you get a bigger TV, you can figure that out. More is not so bad in, in those kind of realms because the way the world works, you'll get there. But here's the thing. Time is finite. You only have so much time. You can't fill your week up to the brim and at the end of the week go, oh man, I forgot to love my neighbors. I'm gonna go to Walmart, pick up two hours and then uh, we'll go use that to invite them over for a cookout. That's not how it works. You only have so much time. There's only 24 hours in a day, 1,440 minutes. That's it. And then it's the next day and you gotta keep moving forward. There's only 365 of those in a year except on a leap year, but that's weird so we won't talk about it. Time is running out. And so what we've got to do is we've got to develop that chef's skill with our lives. When we can look at our life and say, you know what? One more thing is gonna be too much. One more thing is gonna put me over the edge and it's gonna muddle everything else and make everything else worse because it's there on the plate of our lives. Martha chose what was good. Mary chose what was better. There's one more lie. If those other two didn't hit you, this one certainly will. And that is, I live my life so fast because everybody lives like this. It's what everybody's doing. Well, if everybody was gonna jump off a brick, no, that's dumb. Has anybody ever said that to you? You're like, Mom, I wanna, I wanna go to the party. Everybody's gonna be there. Well, if everybody jumped, no, I'm not gonna jump off a bridge. Well, I mean, unless like there's, it's been checked and like, I know that it's okay to jump off the bridge. I'm not gonna say I've never jumped off a bridge, but I'm not gonna do it just because everybody's doing it. I'm not suicidal. I'm not stupid. I, I just wanna go and hang out. I just wanna go have fun. And we will quickly tell that to a kid that wants to go do something stupid, but we look at our lives and go, oh man, everybody else has got three cars and a house that's 1,800 square feet in just the living room and I wanna be like them. I gotta, I gotta do that. Everybody else is doing all this stuff. Everybody else is going on vacation. Everybody else is spending all this money. Everybody else is racking up these credit card bills. I've got to be busy like them. I've got to do the things like they're doing because everybody else is. And that's just as stupid. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. We don't need to live our lives in a hurry because the world says you need this new thing and that new thing. That's not the way it works. You're intelligent people. You can look and say, man, if I add all of that stuff in my life, then I'm not gonna have time to do the things that are important. I'm not gonna have time to do the things that really matter. But we'll take it and we'll use this lie as an excuse for not having enough time to go and love our neighbors. Martha chose what was good. Mary chose what was better. You see, Mary had the chance to physically sit at the feet of God in the flesh, to learn from him, to be there with him. What an amazing opportunity. How many of us, if Jesus walked into our houses today, would do that? And how many would be going trying to hide stuff that we didn't want him to see? Whether that just means dirty clothes on the floor or something that you, you know you didn't need to have in your house in the first place. Mary chose what was better. But here's, here's a really cool thing. God has actually given us the ability to sit and learn at the feet of Jesus. He has given us the opportunity to come and be a part of that if we'll just take the time to do it. In the book of Matthew, which is the, the first book in the New Testament, another of the stories of Jesus' life, there, there's a passage where Jesus is, has been telling all these stories. He's been going back and forth, and finally he says, I'm gonna do this. When the end comes, when judgment comes, I'm gonna separate the goats to the left and the sheep to the right. 
And then to the ones on the right, this is what he says. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 35. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothing and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And those that are on the right, they look at him and they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And here's the kicker. Here's where it all boils down. This is what really matters. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Last week, We said that loving your neighbor is about walking with your eyes up, looking to the needs of others. Not just rushing by in your hurried life and ignoring everything else because you just don't have the time to share. Here's the beauty, though. When we make the time to help those in need, we are sitting and worshiping at the feet of Jesus. When we make time to love our neighbors the way that Jesus has asked us to love everyone that's not us, like they are us, we are doing a true act of worship. One of the biggest Obstacles to neighboring well is time. But what if I told you that creating space in your week, in your day, in your month, in your year to reach out to your neighbors, to love your neighbors, to help your neighbors, to be there for your neighbors could be the greatest act of worship that you do all year long? Because it's there that you're sitting and learning at the feet of Jesus. That because as you live a life as a good neighbor, you get to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And check this out. This is really cool. This is is one of those awesome things that happens that you don't even do on purpose. Because as you're doing that, as you're intentionally going out and loving, as you're intentionally going out and sharing the light of Jesus in the world, not only do you get to worship him, Not only do you get to be a part of what he's doing to be his hands and feet, but you get to show a glimpse of who Jesus is to those people that you're loving. You get to show a glimpse of who Jesus is through the body of Christ that is here on this world making a difference. Last week, Chris had us draw out a a tic-tac-toe board, a hashtag symbol or a a pound sign if you're old like me, and put our name in the middle. And then fill in the other eight blocks with the people that live adjacent to us. How many of those spots were missing that you didn't know who they were? How many of those people did you go this week and find out what their names were? I'm guessing that you were probably like me and the answer is zero because you just didn't have the time. Because your week was busy and it just went by in a flash. But what a difference could we make in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in the world if we carved out just a little bit of time to go and meet our neighbors? and learn what their needs are, learn who they are so that we can go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Because guys, who told you you were in a hurry? Who told you that you had to live life as fast as possible? Take a breath, take a minute. Slow down and make time this week 
or, or next week, maybe a little bit every week, to keep your eyes up, to see the needs of those around you, and to remember that when you love them, you're showing love to their creator. And you're sitting at his feet in worship. Because Martha chose what was good, but Mary chose what was better. Let's pray.